Arsenal 2, Leicester 0 in our commentary game. Kenny Arsenal into the top four and fully deserving of all three points today. Yeah, yeah, that's an easy statement to make. Yeah, better team, Leicester. As predicted, we were hoping for more, but we shouldn't have been too surprised. Uh, yeah, all form, a little bit out of sorts, sums up their season. And Arsenal just too good on the day without being at their best, Nathan. We spent a lot of time at the Emirates, I think, around this stage of the season over five six years where it felt as though the season was petering out there wasn't much happening you could sense right from the start today the atmosphere is different there's a belief in these players what's changed what is it that Mikel Arteta has done that has put them in a position where Champions League football feels like a real possibility for this group now yeah I think uh, just personnel for me and the uh, the setup of the team Uh, uh, the big weakness in this Arsenal team for some years now has always been kind of the defensive uh attitude of the players but certainly the defensive partnership uh, they've never had a, a parent of any real stature looks as if they've gone some way to addressing that the porches of Ben White in the summer Gabriel looks as if he's finding a little bit of form and a bit of confidence alongside Ben White but I think it's the whole um, defensive unit Kieran Tini's as good as anybody in the league uh, Tommy Yasu as well come in and is really impressed Ramsdale gives a real air of kind of calmness and authority behind them and even in front Partey's presence as well and just the attitude of the players out of possession they're working very hard for each other Arsenal now Nathan don't carry any players out of possession of football and that hasn't always been the case I think the attitude of uh, players previously in terms of the defensive side of the game has been questionable so I give credit to Arteta for that he's pl- placed huge demands on the players and they've responded but I think it's really the development of the young brigade of players uh, at the football club I'm talking uh, uh, Saka here in particular Martinelli and Smith Rowe, these players who haven't, haven't come into the football club for huge fees. Odegaard has, he's probably the exception. But that wealth of attacking talent now, which they have in the, in the squad, that really um, means they stand out from the teams in and around them in the league. Those players are only going to get better over the next couple of years. The big challenge for the Arsenal board, maybe, would be to actually keep these players out of the hands of, um, well, so-called uh, bigger teams. But if they can, and if that group of young players in particular can be allowed to develop with some good acquisitions around them, then certainly the, I think the, uh, the future for Arsenal Football Club is uh, yeah, very positive and, and optimistic. There seems to be a real trust around the club, both between the supporters and the players and amongst the players. When you look at the style of football they're playing, Leicester had a huge amount of possession at times in that game. You'd look at a 10-minute spell and they'd have had 85 90% possession. But the Arsenal supporters never got frustrated. They always knew, actually, that Arsenal were biding their time, their structures were right, they were holding their lines of four, and then when they win the ball back, they're absolutely electric. Yeah, well, that's the difference with this Arsenal team. They can sit deep in that low defensive block because they're comfortable in their defensive setup. If you haven't got confidence in your defensive setup, you you feel nervous when you're defending on the edge of your box. This Arsenal team don't. They can drop off. They almost invite you onto them. They want to open up those spaces in behind opposition teams. We can see the pace of Martinelli and Saka in particular uh, on the counter-attack. But also they get on the front foot as well. It's not as if they haven't got players who can't get on the ball and dictate. Uh, you know, Jack is comfortable on the ball. I'd say Partey's probably more functional in that area of the pitch. All their responsibility is in that central area is just to feed the ball to those attacking players. Odegaard in particular is playing that number 10 role, isn't he? Just kind of drifting between the lines. I think every time Jack and Partey gets the ball, I think the instruction is just to get him, just keep uh, punching those 10, 15 yard balls into his feet. And once he gets turned, Nathan facing the opposition goal, then things start to happen. He's looking for Saka, he's looking for Martinelli. Not so much Lacazette, to be honest with you, in behind. He's a little bit reluctant Lacazette nowadays to run in behind, wants the ball to his feet, wants to knit things together. I mean, that's not unusual in the modern game. We're used to seeing centre forwards dropping off the front, but got real variation to their attack and real kind of pace and, and dynamism, uh, dynamism as well. So we're an exciting team to watch Arsenal when they get on the front foot, but they've also got that little bit of more defensive solidity and organisation, which we haven't seen uh, before and which has been their downfall. The four of those exciting players, the three who started, Odegaard, Martinelli, Saka and Smith Rowe coming off the bench. It, there's not many teams, if any, in the Premier League who have so much young, exciting, attacking talent. Odegaard was the one who maybe stood out the most today and you're talking about him there. He deserves an enormous amount of credit when you think he's still only 23, but going to Real Madrid when you're 15 years of age, the weight of expectation, there was a feeling he'd become the best player in the world. We know it never works out like that, but he's managed to keep it together and now he's probably just developing at a time when you'd expect him to be developing. 
Yeah, I think it's been a good move for both parties. I think it's been a good move for Arsenal, but it's been a good move for him. I think Arsenal have rescued him, to be honest with you, Nathan. I'll bet it took a bid, big uh, fee to get him there. I think his problem, I, I look at Odegaard, to be honest, Nathan. I, I see a player probably can only play in one position, that number 10 position, that kind of bear camp position. Probably saw a little bit of that bear camp playing him today, kind of drifting between the lines, playing at his own pace, almost dictating from that number 10 position which is exactly what Bergkamp used to do. I think at Real Madrid, if you look at the way they've played the past couple of years, don't really play with a 10. You have to play off the wide areas or playing a midfield three at Real Madrid, and that's not his best position. So I think it just suits him at Arsenal, just dropping in behind Lacazette. And then with the help that he gets from the sides, the likes of Mark, uh, Martinelli narrowing up and Bukayo Saka looking to play those little combinations. He looks really comfortable in that environment. The race for the top four then, it's in Arsenal's hands. They're a point ahead of Manchester United. They've three games in hand, but they still have 12 games to go. They're still yeah. a third of the season, essentially, still to play. And they're probably going to enter a different phase now over the next couple of weeks where the pressure is going to be on. Yeah. They're going to go from being the hunters to being the hunted. How big a challenge is that for them? And how do you feel that's going to sit with an Arsenal that, like flaky is the word you would use for Arsenal yeah. for five, six, seven years at this stage. Do you think this side is past that? I'd be more confident, but you're right. I think that's the question around these young players. They are very inexperienced. There's no doubt in their individual qualities. We've seen that all season. We've spoken about the players in particular. But it's kind of the mental aspect, the psycholo psychological aspect of the game now, how they can how they cope with that pressure and the demands between now and the end of the season, particularly now as they're sitting in that forward position. A lot of people will be making them clear fa favourites now with those games in hand. I don't quite see it like that. I think it's a lot closer than that because of the nature of those games that they have in, in hand. Liverpool, uh, Chelsea, I think Tottenham, that you've mentioned, they're not easy. Man yeah, exactly. Huge games coming up. So... Yeah, you're absolutely right. We're really going to see where they're going. To, players are going to be tested now, in terms of kind of their mental strength uh, going forward. But I would be confident because they are in a good place. Uh, they're playing well, and those some of those younger players do play with a lot of maturity. Saka, in particular, for me, I've spoken about. Even um, uh, Smith Rowe, for me, is a, is a player with kind of an old head on young shoulders. So those attributes are serving well between now and the end of the season. But it's a it's a small squad. It's not the uh, strongest in depth. And people might say a little bit of luck, key players between now and the end of the season. If they're to lose, maybe Thomas Partey for any significant amount of time. If Ben White was to pick up an injury and, and, and miss a month of the season, that could prove crucial as well. You know, keep the majority of that squad fit between now and the end of the season. They'll never get a better chance. And in terms of long term, well, maybe a huge amount of it depends on Champions League football and what they can go and invest during the summer. Is it is it the number nine role that should be the key focus this summer? Does a a better quality than Alexandra Lacazette transformed this side from being maybe Champions League position contenders to be title contenders? Are they still still a million miles away from that? I think there's some way away from being title contenders, but just just to maintain their position in the top four and start to push towards that top three, I think they, they do certainly need investments in key areas. Centre forward's an obvious one. I think they tried to do it under the transfer window. They tried to get hold of Latvich. I thought would have been a very good signing uh, for them for a lot of reasons. Weren't able to get him. So I think they'll have to invest again in terms of centre forward. Uh, Lacazette for me is, isn't the future. I think Arsenal have actually seen the best of him. Uh, I think they need to invest in that area of the pitch. I'd like to see him invest again in centre midfield. I think they could do with another top class centre midfielder and even centre half as well, right down the spine of the team. I think there's a decent pair in being established at centre half. But I don't think you can just have two in that area of the pitch. Uh, they got holding there as a backup, I understand. But when you look at the like Liverpool and and Chelsea and even Manchester City, I mean, they have four top class like centre halves in that area of the pitch. Jack as well in centre midfield, I'm not a big fan of. I think they could do better there. So I think really down the spine of the team for me, if I was being a little bit greedy from an Irish perspective, that's where I'd be looking to spend my money. Centre forward, centre midfield, and centre half. Being three players in, that's easier said than done. You're laughing, I understand uh, what you're saying, but those players are out there. And if they could push, get a few out the door, get a bit of money in and do a little bit of a stupid business, then they'll be in a very good place going forward. It feels as though it's between Arsenal and Manchester United now. They had a huge win yesterday against Tottenham. Cristiano Ronaldo with the hat-trick. And this maybe both things can be right, that Cristiano Ronaldo is still a fabulous finisher, but that Manchester United will be a better team if he wasn't there. That is the big debate out of this. Like you know, Every time he scores a goal, it's how can you be critical of Cristiano Ronaldo when he does things like he did yesterday? Where do you stand on Ronaldo and where he fits in and how much of an asset he is to Manchester United? Well, we know, we know the qualities that he brings that was best displayed yesterday in terms of the quality of his, uh, his finishing. 
Um, he's absolutely uh, uh, lethal. So that's you know that's unquestionable. In terms of how the new manager, wherever he is when he comes in, how he wants to play, how he sees Christian Aldo's uh, um, role in the team, I'm not too sure. We know the modern manager now coming in, the demands, well, I spoke about Arteta, the demands he places on his players, our possession. I'm sure the new manager comes into Manchester United, it'll be very much the same. I'm not sure Ronaldo's given out a few vibes of delay, I'm not exactly sure. The kind of uh, short to medium term he sees himself in Manchester United, even still. But I still think he can make an impact between now and the end of the season. If you look at Arsenal and Manchester United at the moment, it's difficult to make an argument for Manchester United actually coming out on top of Arsenal. The, le- the consistent level of Arsenal's performances, the run that they're on at the moment. Manchester United, Feaster fam, you literally don't know what you're going to get. Seems like turmoil at one moment at the football club. The whole dressing room was imploded. But yet they turned up yesterday and put in that type of performance, albeit Ronaldo was at his very best. So although it's difficult to make a strong argument for uh, maybe Manchester United uh, coming out on top of Arsenal, it's just a bit of a good feeling. You just sense as if there's some, still something there. There's still a heartbeat in that Manchester United in dressing room that could make, they could still maybe put pull themselves together and put a type of run together that could still maybe um, make up that gap uh, with Arsenal and take that last Champions League uh, position. It'll be fascinating to see. You're saying Kenny Cunningham never hopped off to Portugal when he wasn't picked for a game? <laughs> Core town, uh, maybe, uh, but that even about it. No, exactly. That's all part of it, isn't it? Ronaldo, he's not happy. He's not happy when he, when he doesn't play. This is the problem you have when you bring a player like that into the football club. At his stage of his career, Cristiano Ronaldo hasn't signed for Manchester United to spend time on the bench. You have to understand that Pochettino's finding that situation at PSG in terms of uh, Messi and, uh, and Neymar in particular. So that's something which the new manager coming into Manchester United is going to have to wrestle with. That's why he's got to be a strong personality. He's got to be able to front out, front out a few of those players in the dressing room and do what's right for the football club but that's in the that's in the future it's about the here and the now and like I said that's a hell of a race now between Manchester United and Arsenal there's a co- couple of other teams in the running a few weeks ago wasn't it? you mentioned Spurs yourself but you're right I think that defeat yesterday for Spurs really puts them out running West Ham as well it's really a two horse race now between United and, and Arsenal and just to touch on relegation we didn't see Everton today but beaten again it's now I think it's two wins in 19 matches for Everton Leeds got a late winner Watford won today the cliche is they're too good to go down but the argument is well then you're too good to be in a relegation scrap in the first place yeah. how much trouble are Everton in right now yeah I think it's about, well five teams are in a lot of uh, a lot of trouble I think those back to back wins from Brentwood have taken them out of the equation Luke, Newcastle likewise and all those teams below them I think it's the five teams they're all in uh, trouble that was a big win for Leeds today Nathan I watched the midweek they were literally all at sea uh, losing to Aston Villa at home. They looked absolutely rudderless and void of confidence in that game. But they've bounced back today, got a last-minute winner, so that lift the whole uh, football club. Burnley looked as if they were putting a bit of a run together to get themselves there. They've dropped back as well. Watford, he'd written them off a couple of weeks ago. Suddenly, they found a win from absolutely nowhere yesterday. And you're right, everything are banging. You're absolutely right. Of course, they're not good to go down. Big problem they have. We're talking about Arsenal in terms of the strides they've made in central defence, how much more solid they're looking for everything, it's the opposite. They've got a gaping hole in the centre of their defence. Michael Keane, the most experienced defender. Lampard's had to take him out of four in line. Really struggling. Lost his, he's lost his confidence. Uh, really struggling in that area of the pitch. And even other players as well. Cavard Loon's come back into the team. He's been very quiet, Nathan. That's a lad who's exceptional um, early part of the season. He needs to find his form quick. Still feel as if Everton will have enough to, uh, to get out of it. Like I said, probably similar to Manchester United. More of a, more of a good feeling when it comes to Everton. But, um, yeah, it'll be fascinating. It'll be more twists and turns between now and the end of the season. It's great. It's great we're still talking about uh, uh, a battle for the title, a battle for fourth place. And, of course, those five teams who it looks like now battling for those uh, two remaining places, which will keep them in the Premier League. Great stuff as always, Kenny.